Welcome to the Cashflow Ninja, the podcast sharing how to create and grow income streams and manage, multiply, and protect your wealth in the new economy. Are you tired of trading your time for money? Do you desire freedom today instead of retirement in 10, 20, or 30 years? I'm MC Lobsher, and this is the Cashflow Ninja. This is Cashflow Ninja. My name is MC Lobster, and thank you so much for spending your most valuable resource, your time, once again with me on the show. Uh, again, you can check out all of our past episodes at CashflowNinja.com, along with our community resources, tools, and our programs. And of course, I have launched a new book, which I'm very excited about, and uh, getting a lot of great feedback on it. Uh, if you haven't picked up my book, you can go to cashflowninja.com forward slash 21 niches. That's N I C H E S, 21 niches. Uh, and uh, you can grab a copy of the book. When you buy the book, I'm also giving you access to the book bundle, uh, which includes a digital copy of the book, a audio um, copy of the book, and also I've curated a library of all the guests that's been on my show talking about these 21 niches. And there's also bonus videos on there. So check it out at cashflowninja.com forward slash 21 niches. That's two one niches. This is episode number 700. So 700 episodes of uh, the Cashflow Ninja. Uh, and I just want to really start off by expressing my gratitude for your support, for being on this journey with me. I can't believe we've clocked 700 episodes of Cashflow Ninja. And then um, we have clocked over 110 episodes of the Cashflow Investing Secrets podcast, where I share what I've learned from interview, uh, interviewing amazing guests on my show uh, and insights and also other things that I think might be of value uh, for you. All that at CashflowNinja.com. But episode 700, and I've got a very special guest, friend of the show, uh, Doug Casey, uh, the international man, the original international man. Um, Doug's been on the show a number of times, always providing uh, just uh, some incredible insights uh, of what's going on in the world and what you can do about it to position yourself, your family and your, your business and your investments to be on the right side of it. So um, absolutely uh, excited to have Doug back. Doug, thank you so much for coming back on the show. It's a pleasure to be back, MC. It actually is. Yeah, great to connect with you. Um, so you've been up to a lot of different things. Uh, move, uh, some relocation, uh, some fantastic uh, uh, adventures online. You've got your own YouTube channel, uh, which I would highly recommend, by the way, for our listeners uh, and our viewers out there. Uh, Doug's, uh, just put in Doug Casey on YouTube, and also I would subscribe on Odyssey and BitChute and so forth uh, in case uh, they decide to uh, miraculously move that, that show. But you've been, you, you've been pretty busy, Doug. Um, uh, how are things going on your end, and, and what's, what's, what's new? Well, I can't complain, although I believe that, in fact, there's plenty to complain about uh, <laughs> in the U.S. at this point. Uh, I'm not sure if we spoke before uh, the Biden regime was installed in Washington or not. I don't recall whether we talked before that or not. But now that they're there, we have genuine Marxists in, uh, in command in Washington. And uh, they're actually Bolsheviks. They're, uh, they, they believe the same things. They have the same psychology. That's the most important thing. The same philosophical and psychological makeup as the Bolsheviks did in Russia in 1917, or for that matter, the Jacobins did in France in 1789. Yep. Same damn people, exactly. And, and there are a lot of other instances throughout history where a country actually goes psychotic. There's lots of other indicators of the U.S. going psychotic. One of them is, of course, this, this vaccine hysteria. Uh, it's, it's turned into a vaccine psychosis. It's gone beyond the level of hysteria at this point. So as much as I enjoy being here in the U.S. with all the advantages and pleasures that the U.S. affords, 
Uh, I'm very happy next week to be returning to uh, my estancia in Uruguay, where they're crazy there too, incidentally. That's not to say that that's a, like a haven of freedom or, any, or anything, but it's a small country. It's a rural country. It's a tourist driven country. Uh, it's a peaceful country, especially in terms of South America. So uh, I'm happy to uh, go back there and get a change of environment. So yeah, everything's been going okay. Can't complain. Yeah, and that's we're, far. Yeah. And, we're, and we're working, we're starting to work on the fourth book okay. in the novel series, uh, which is gonna be called Terrorist. Uh, I'm trying to take each book up to a higher level. Started out with the politically incorrect uh, book Speculator, because I'm trying to reform the unjustly besmirched reputations of uh, politically incorrect occupations. And uh, we start out with Speculator, which is a book about our hero who's, who's uh, in his early 20s and gets lucky on a mining stock and goes off to Africa, gets involved in a bush war with boy soldiers and all that. It's a damn good book. And then the next book, he uh, becomes a drug lord. Drug lords are all supposed to be bad guys, but we show that a drug lord can be a good guy, as our hero is. And uh, as with Speculator, the government steals all his money from him again. So he becomes an assassin. Uh, and this book, <coughs> Assassin, got to show you the book. Yeah. Is, um, is about, uh, it's a moral uh, play. Uh, is it right or wrong? to be a political assassin? Is it effective or not effective? Does it actually improve things? So it's a, a hell of a story with a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff about historical assassinations, kind of looking at it from the other end of the telescope, if you would. And um, so now in the fourth book, we're working, but people ought to get assassin, actually. I, I think it's probably the best of the three. They should get all three. I'm trying to, what I'm trying to do, MC, is it's time for a new Atlas Shrugged. Yeah. And Atlas Shrugged was a giant book, like, I don't know, 800, 900 pages. Yep. And uh, what we're trying to do here is uh, do the same thing with a vastly different kind of plot line uh, over the course of seven increasingly politically incorrect novels. So people can take it in bite size, relatively, pieces. Anyway, so that's what I've been up to, I guess, among yeah. other things. That's, that's fantastic and, and fantastic stuff. And I would highly recommend all the books. They're great. And I cannot wait for terrorists because, you know, one man's terrorist is another man's uh, freedom fighter, right? So yeah, that's, that's, that's right. And if, you're, and if you're not sure, you're, uh, you're, you're just a rebel. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, or what, what's the joke that George Carlin said? You know, uh, uh, if, uh, what is it? What, what do freedom fighters fight? You know, if oh. you know, do, do, do yeah. they fight freedom? That's right. <laughs> yeah. So it's 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 fascinating stuff, and I really appreciate what you're doing with that series. And I just remember the impact that uh, Ayn Rand had with all of Atlas Shrug, and of course the virtue of selfishness, which uh, is just, I mean, when you read it, you just cannot put it down. <laughs> yeah. you, you can't. In fact. I almost, I had to, put, but I had to put that, put uh, the virtue of selfishness down when I read the first page because I was so shocked that somebody had crystallized on paper what I'd been thinking rather inchoately for many years. I read it when I was eh, probably 21. So I recommend people buy that when they go on Amazon too. It's a work of genius. Yeah, fantastic stuff. And I can't wait to see the, the next release and what's coming there. Um, but I mean, it's been an interesting time over the, the past 20 months, right? We've, we've gone from 15 days to slow the spread to now. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, I, you cannot uh, do anything else, but look at this in, in just bewilderment that now it's, um, you know, injection mandates, uh, injection passports, just to basically participate as a normal functioning human being in, 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 a, in, a, in society. Um, which is just very eerie, of course, growing up in South Africa and seeing pass laws uh, and uh, segregation firsthand to see and witnessing that this is, these are concepts that are just accepted across the board, it seems, yeah. 
Uh, no, people have turned into genuine whip dogs that they aren't affronted or shocked or disgusted when some nobody asks them to see if their papers are in order. I mean, this is this is just absolutely insane. Maybe it's me. I don't know. What's the, there's lots of reasons that I, I could posit for why things have gone so badly. I mean, maybe one of them is that a quarter of the adults in the U.S. are on things like Prozac and Xanax and a hundred other uh, drugs that you know turn you into a semi-zombie. Could be that, yep. or uh, or could be definitely is that for the last several generations, uh, people have gone off to be indoctrinated in the school system, which has been totally captured by the Marxists and the welfare statites and socialists and horrible people like that. And they indoctrinate kids. And, um, you know, St. Ignatius Loyola said it, uh, and Lenin said it too. Uh, Give me a kid until he's eight years old and he's mine for life. And it's true. You imprint these crazy thoughts socialist type thoughts on a kid's mind. And it's really hard to get rid of them. Uh, yep. It's put there early. So yeah, I'm afraid the bad guys are winning at this point. Yeah, it's it's just quite incredible. And just staying on the schools for a second. I mean, th- this is the future generation, what they're doing there. Uh, I mean, some of the behaviors uh, of adults, I, I can't even I can't even explain it. I mean, you have people are very excited that they want to put masks on children and have it on them constantly in their schools. They get excited talking about it. Um, But even if you just look at schools in general, I mean, there was a meme going around. (laughs) We're living in this age of memes where they would have they would have pictures up of either a school or a prison. And you had to guess whether it's a school or a prison. (laughs) And I tell you. I was wrong 50% of the time. And when you drive past them, uh, I mean, still, you had to, you now have to pause and ask yourself a question. Is, it, is that a school or a prison there? Because it looks pretty much like a prison. Well, actually, uh, there, are, there, there are a lot more analogs between the two of them because it costs about $50,000 a year to keep the average prison in prisoner in prison for a year. Yep. And let's say 50000 it could be a lot more, is what it costs to send a kid to college. But maybe the prison does less damage than the college does, uh, quite frankly. You know, I went to college uh, for four years uh, during the days of the uh, drug. And, you know, we fought and run, won the uh, revolution, the, the drug revolution. And then we fought and won the uh, sexual revolution in those days. It was kind of fun and it was kind of a privilege to go to college. Not everybody did. And it wasn't terribly expensive like it is today. But if I'd had good counsel when I was in high school, even back then, I wouldn't have gone to college. And it was much more valuable and not nearly as PC as it is today. Not not by any means. So uh, I counsel kids today in high school when I get a chance do not go to college. These are four very important years. Uh, don't waste all that money and indenture yourself with all that money. Uh, take those four years, lay out a plan, and you can turn yourself into a Renaissance man during those four years instead of sitting in a desk listening to nobody's lecture you about stupid and worthless things in most cases. Yeah, no, absolutely. And staying on, on the education side of it too, um, I mean, we, we're seeing some trends here that a lot of entrepreneurs are already capitalizing on, uh, the, the education trends. I mean, the statistics that are coming out on homeschooling, it's one of the biggest mm. trends. Uh, people are starting to realize, I think this is, this is actually kind of, if we can look at this in a positive light, because parents have started to see what happens in schools and happen to their children, and a lot of them were pretty shocked. Um, so the homeschooling is up on the rise. And I think people have also started to realize that, uh, especially when students came home for, from college and they did all these virtual classes that, you know, you have to, you have to look at what the value proposition is. Um, we're, I mean, we're now into the fourth industrial revolution. We have machine learning, AI, robotics, um, 
the internet of things, 5G, there is, and it's a skill economy. It's no longer a jobs economy, which the Prussian school model delivered for folks for. Yes. So if you look at the, the value proposition of college is, are you a doctor, lawyer, or, I mean, there's no way that just a, just a standard uh, a degree is going to offer any value because if you go into college now for what, for four years, it's 2021. What does the world even look like in 2025? You have yes. any skill set yeah. that you would learn in four years now in college that you would go, could go out in the marketplace and do anything in 2025. Well, you don't really learn a skill set in college because yeah. most people wind up taking things like English or sociology or psychology or, God forbid, gender studies or really soft subjects like that. Uh, anyway, you can't buy an education. I mean, it's insane paying all that money to get a piece of paper to say that you logged four years at some goofy institution. I mean... With the internet and a little bit of discipline, you've got all the knowledge of the world at your fingertips, basically for free. So it's actually insane to go to college. And if you want to chase girls or boys and drink beer, hey, you don't need to go to college to do that, believe it or not. Yeah. <laughs> believe it or not. Yeah. But again, there's so much, and I've already started to see entrepreneurs got, coming into the space and especially on the value side um you see great educational companies that are now doing children's books uh which is just fascinating i mean it's, uh, there's a company called brave books for example uh that are putting out great great uh books monthly for children and of course you've got the tuttle twins and connor boyack and and so forth doing great uh work from a libertarian standpoint and libertarian principles um, in, in the and messages in the book, so there. I mean, there's so much opportunities uh, for folks to to capitalize on that. Um, yeah. So one of the questions, Doug, that a lot of folks in, in our community uh, uh, would ask me, they look at this and they say, "Look, we're seeing over the first 20 months." I think the joke was, "How was your how was your free trial in 20 months of Marxism? Are you enjoying it?" <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So they understand what, 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 what's going on. You're making your way down uh, to Latin America. I mean, it seems that if you're going to countries in Latin America and Africa and so forth, they might not necessarily have the bandwidth uh, from a government standpoint to uh, enforce all of these really bad uh, draconian ideas that they have as, for example, cover, uh, governments in the, in the West and especially the Five Eyes uh, governments, right? Well, I'd like to believe that. Uh, I've, I've been to 155 or so countries. I've lived in 10. And uh, the problem is this. You're right. Some of these smaller, less, less, less um, advanced, uh, if you want to use that word, countries. Yeah, you're right about that. But on the other hand, you look at the people that go into government. And they're the same type everywhere. You've got two kinds of people. You've got people that like to control the physical universe, things, creating things, moving things, making things. And then you've got people that like to control and manipulate other people. And that's the type that always goes into government. So these people in government, everybody thinks they ought to run the world and they're important and, and so forth, but they are the worst kind of people. They're the kind of people that you don't even want to say hello to. Uh, and they gravitate towards government. So everywhere in the world that has a government, you get these basically criminal type personalities that run the governments. Some are better, some are worse, but uh, it's, a, it's a play. It makes me wonder what the hell is the matter with the average human that uh, he actually puts up with this nonsense. Yeah, because you're, you're starting to see it now in the West. I mean, for folks that have followed, um, I would say, Latin American politics and African politics for a while, it's pretty simple. You want to get in power so that you can reward your friends and punish your enemies. Yes. Pretty, pretty straightforward. That's, that's the name of the game. <laughs> that's, that's why a brother-in-law all of a sudden becomes a major, you know, contractor, you know, construction contractor, you know, if, uh, if, if, 
uh, he's he's brought his brother-in-law gets into power, and the other folks lose all of the contracts. But I think people are starting to see that now um, in the in the West too that nobody's coming to save them. There's no there's no man or woman on a white horse <laughs> leading well, leading them out of this. It, in fact, in fact, it's worse than that because. Uh, I hate to say something that sounds like a Republican could say it, uh, because I don't have any respect for the Republicans. But um, the fact is that the United States, or I should say America, actually, was unique in that it was the only country in the world's history that actually underwrote and promoted and, and made its essence you know, certain characteristics uh, that are unique to Western civilization uh, as well. Like what other country actually built its ethos around free thought and free speech and free markets and uh, limited government and, uh, oh my God, the concept of liberty, the concept of progress, uh, privacy, property rights, rule of law. I mean, these things are actually unique to America and the people that are in charge now, certainly in Washington, but in a lot of the state capitals and a lot of the county seats and cities, yep. they despise these things. They want to wash this all away. And the problem is, is when uh, the idea of America's walked away, the whole world has got no place to run. Yep. Where are you going to run? <laughs> so it's a yeah. problem. Yeah, because that was one of the first things. And I came here in 2001. So this was, I mean, there was already a lot of problems <laughs> then, um, uh, and this was prior to 9-11, but um, I just couldn't believe the upward mobility too in the U.S., that the, some of this, the things still exist, because sometimes you go to certain places and, yeah, you can find your niche, you know, you can find a higher ground, that's why I love the name of the higher ground series books, um, and an unlevel playing field, with, uh, as you've shared, uh, but the upward mobility is just if you come here with a certain work ethic and certain ideas and creativity, um, I mean, the, the, the sky is, uh, is the sky is the limit. So, um, yeah, because I one of the questions, like I said, where do people go? Where do where do folks go? And there's no there's nowhere to go now because everywhere is pretty much under the same, I would say, control or folks that think the same, which kind of binds them together which was pretty interesting too. Doug, you've yeah. traveled all over the world. You've seen so many different cultures. You've lived in different countries, different languages, different cuisine. You know, um, people have different experiences. They have different worldviews. They have different ways of solving problems, which makes us all so unique. But essentially over the past 20 months, <laughs> is everybody was handed the same hammer to hit the same nail, right? Yeah, that's, that's right. Uh, I don't know how this current hysteria, or I should say psychosis, because it's beyond hysteria. I'm not sure how it's going to wind up, uh, quite frankly. But one possibility is we're going to have an actual civil war of some type in the United States uh, and maybe in some other countries as well. Uh, and I point out that uh, the unpleasantness of uh, 1861 to 1865 in the United States was not an actual civil war. Yep. It was a war of secession, which is very different from a civil war. Civil war is one where two groups are trying to take over the same land area, the same government. Not the yep. case uh, back then. It was a war of secession where the South just wanted to go its own way. And then we can get into this whole thing about, well, what about slavery and all that? Actually, that had relatively little, believe it or not, to do with what happened back then. But that's a different 